Meanwhile, on the comic box, we return to the land of horror comics, plus New Mutants and Black Panther. And maybe The Gifted. There's a lot in this episode. Why don't you kick it, Ray? Uh, yeah, Dr. Ray here. Yeah. On the podcast, uh, lending his services to Rob. Laying it down. Comics. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Comic Box, part of the geek to geek Podcast Network. I am Rob, your friendly neighborhood comic geek. And joining me this week, once again, is Dr. Ray. Welcome back, Ray. A pleasure to be here. So uh, I was talking to you about like the topics that I was going to be doing this month, it being October, all the horror comics and stuff. And you had mentioned that you actually grew up reading horror comics, which I didn't know. I didn't know you actually grew up uh, reading like the old EC comics and stuff. Um, yeah, when I was a kid, my first exposure to comics was actually at my grandparents, who kept a box of my father and his brother's comic books. Uh, they grew up during the Marvel moment, so there was a lot of uh, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, um, some Avengers comics um, okay. from those, you know, mid-60s, early 70s. I have never heard the phrase Marvel moment. Was Are you talking kind of like Bronze Age when the Marvel comics were coming back in a big way? I'm talking about um, when Marvel comics were kind of... I actually got the term from Brad Chisholm, a uh, college professor of ours, who yeah. taught a comic comic book cinema class mm -hmm. and that was uh his term to describe post bronze age how marvel kind of came onto the scene in a big way with more relatable superheroes like spider-man interesting who weren't sidekicks they were the stars yeah um like johnny storm mm -hmm. the human torch he was someone who readers could kind of relate to and marvel comics sort of pioneered that movement interesting See, you're teaching me things. I feel like a bad, uh, what, friendly neighborhood comic geek. <laughs> um, but yeah, shout out to Brad Chisholm. Yeah. Right, up at uh, yeah, St. Cloud State University. Amazing professor and yeah. a lot of fun. Got me back into comics. Speaking of yep. growing up, I read comics, would watch uh, cartoons mm -hmm. featuring comic book superheroes, typically. And um, yeah, my first exposure was the, were those old issues from the 60s and 70s of mostly Marvel. Also, they had a collection of EC comics, so like Strange Tales yeah. and Tales from the Crypt and Horror Tales. <laughs> I'm not sure all the titles. I just remember uh, the covers and the stories. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get into that. But first, uh, we need to do our weekly geekery, which is how we've been keeping it geek this week, the exceptionally geeky things we have been doing. Uh, I will go first because I want to talk about the film festival that I went to last weekend, on Friday the 13th, I joined uh, Damien, friend of the show, I know he listens, but never comes on, I think just because he's not a big comic book guy, <laughs> or he's afraid, Damien. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> um, but he invited us, and I accepted the challenge of going to a Friday the 13th festival, which was at a, what they call a mini cinema or something, uh, in Minneapolis, and it seats like i don't know 50 people or something mm -hmm. like that it's, it's very small but i guess they just recently redid it so it had new seats but it started at 6 p.m ended at 8 a.m straight friday the 13th movies 10 minutes in between uh the first one was introduced by the guy who actually played jason in the first movie so he was the kid in the <laughs> lake at the very end of the first friday the 13th and i'm guessing he's done very little afterwards <laughs> but i don't want to be mean if i'm wrong uh, but nice guy, he introduced the movie, and then he was out in between films signing stuff and taking pictures with people. Cool. Um, I'm not a giant Friday the 13th fan. I much prefer, I think, Nightmare on Elm Street just for the premise, um, though those movies certainly get really terrible in the middle mm -hmm. as well. Um, and it was a haul. I've never done anything like that before. Like, I've done all-day movie things. We've done it at my place. We've done it at your place in college where we just stay up all night watching movies until, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Yeah. But I've never done a dedicated, like, film festival overnight kind of thing. Um, so that was really interesting. And then beyond that, this past week, oh, I didn't actually make a list of the comics that I've read. I was trying to finish off some things. There's one, and I don't have it down here. There was... Um, a comic, I'll put a picture up on Twitter. It's it's this idea that uh, a city of... Well, I was talking to you about it when we went to the... the yeah, Falcon. 
Falcon, yeah. When there's a city that looks kind of like an angelic city full of aliens that look like angels, angels. crash lands near Los Angeles, and then this comic takes place years later. I didn't end up finishing it. Okay. Uh, so I'm still in the middle of reading that, and then I'm reading through um, the second Harry Potter book. Oh, okay. Just Very cool. on the e-reader, because I have it. And uh, beyond that, the wife and I are still watching The Office. I am now in season two of Always oh. Sunny in Philadelphia, oh. which I've never seen before. Uh, I watched part of the first episode of the Lore TV show, which I really want to see. It's a great... Do you know about Lore? I've all? seen it, heard about it, but yeah. I haven't watched it yet. So it's a really great podcast. I'm a big fan. And um, it's now a TV show on Amazon. And I got through part of the first episode. I just I haven't gotten the time to to do it because it's on Amazon and I have Netflix and Hulu on my phone. So I'm more likely to sit and watch Netflix yeah. than I am Amazon. Um, and then the last thing is that I um, watched most of the first. I feel really bad. Like I'm partway through <laughs> yeah. everything. Uh, I watched most of the first episode of The Gifted. And I was actually watching it as you showed up at my house here. <laughs> so I'm about five minutes from the ending. Have oh. you have you seen that at all? No, I have not. Okay. I'm sorry to have disturbed your viewing experience. <laughs> That's okay. I meant to uh, end up watching it before, like well before, you know, when it was first coming out. But I just, I didn't get, same as Inhumans. I think Inhumans is on Hulu or somewhere. Yeah. But I haven't touched it. And <laughs> yeah. I will see if and when. I hear it's terrible, so I'm just <laughs> kind of holding off. Um, but it's, uh, it's not bad, actually. Oh. It's directed by Brian Singer, the first episode. Blink factors in, in oh. a big way. I think they do a pretty good job with the powers. It doesn't feel like they're skimping on the budget. Um, but we'll see when they get further into the show. And yeah. kind of like Legends of Tomorrow has Firestorm, but he's never Firestorm <laughs> because they can't afford it. And you're <laughs> like, then why did you use Firestorm? Like, why just use a different character? <laughs> so they seem to have you know, more subtle powers, you know, they can move things with their mind and it doesn't take a lot of extra um, special effects outside yeah. of pulling the thing, <laughs> that kind of idea. Just uh, keep the ropes and strings out of frame. And... Right. But beyond that, it seems like it's pretty good. Like, I don't know if I'm going to add it to a thing I have to watch every single week just because I do a bad job with that. Yeah. But I could see myself maybe binging it later, kind of like I did the first two seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, um... There's some things that are kind of weird. Like, they have the guy who I think is supposed to be, like, Thunderbird or something like that, or, or Warpath. Oh, okay. Because um, he's got the eagle tattoo on his arm that, like, allows him to see visions. <laughs> and then he's got enhanced, like, senses. Um, but, like, why does he have to be sleeveless and wearing a vest? <laughs> the answer is because he's a Native American character, <laughs> and they don't know how to deal with that otherwise. And I think that's a shame. But maybe they're trying to do a callback. There was one major... Uh, callback to the cartoon is one guy's cell phone ringtone is the theme from the 90s cartoon. Oh, very cool. So that was neat. And then the other stuff they're doing are interesting. Maybe I'll do another episode just on Gifted some point down the road after I've seen a couple of episodes. Uh, so how about you? How, what's your weekly geekery this week? Well, I would say the big thing is I binged the entire Netflix original series, Mind Hunter. Ooh, okay. Um, how was that? Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. Okay. Um, it's a David Fincher joint. Okay. Um, so, you know, it has those very distinct visuals, very, uh, and it deals with uh, sort of the birth of criminal psychology in the 70s. Okay. So it's the start of profiling the killers and that whole mindset that they're in and using that to interviewing uh, serial killers, or as they were referred to at, at the time, sequence killers. Okay. And kind of getting to know their psychology to help them catch other serial killers. So is it a really cerebral show, or is it more of an action-based thing? I would say it's a nice combination of both. Okay. It's very cerebral in the interviewing, and when they go into prisons and interview the inmates, mm -hmm. and then it becomes more of a thriller when they're out in the field trying to solve crimes. It's a cool framing device. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And I've seen nothing but good things about it. Yeah. Which is cool, because Netflix is buying literally anything. Like, if you have a... And South Park did an episode on this, actually, <laughs> of, like, if you have a script, you call them, and they literally say, you know, Netflix, you've been greenlit. <laughs> Is how they answer their phone because there's so much original content, but it's nice that every once in a while a gem sort of emerges from the rough, yeah, if you will. 
So Mind Hunters, how many episodes is it? Uh, it's ten. Ten episodes. That's also nice too. Yeah. It doesn't have to be twenty three episodes <laughs> or whatever. It can be ten. Or the Defenders was eight. Yeah. Um. I I've, I've considered going back and rewatching Stranger Things because season two is coming this month. Me too. And I I'm, think that's also like eight episodes or that's something. That's on my cue, Stranger Things, because I know the new ones are coming out, so gotta yeah. catch up. And you've already seen the first one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. What else have you been up to this week? Any Reading anything? or? Uh, let's see. What have I been reading? Well, since going to FallCon, I've been trying to catch up with all the comics I bought at FallCon. Okay. Including uh, one of my favorites, DC Bombshells. I got a signed copy of that book. That's right. Now, the person who signed it was the artist? Yep. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, because they had a booth, and I saw that you were saying that the first volume is actually really good. Yeah. Which, to me, was like, it's a concept for toys, it, for what, statues. It was based on a toy line. Yeah. DC Bombshell's toy line, and then they... So, it sounds like a flimsy premise yeah. for a comic, but it's actually pretty neat. It's set in... Uh, during World War II, okay. when all the men are off fighting, mm-hmm. and there are no male superheroes, but all the female superheroes are there. And Is it that the male superheroes are at war, or just they don't exist? They don't exist. Oh, um, interesting. You do see a young Bruce Wayne, mm-hmm. and him and his parents are leaving uh, the showing of Zorro, right. where they're infamously gunned down, but they aren't. They are saved by Batwoman, who uh, shows up and beats the thief with her bat, and uh, saves Bruce Wayne's parents. Interesting. And uh, the premise behind that character is that, uh, for one, she's a lesbian, so it's cool to see a nice portrayal of LGBTQ characters. Yep, I'm happy they but, kept that aspect for Bombshells. Uh, beyond that, um, the reason she's Batwoman isn't just because she goes after thugs with a baseball bat, but she's actually part of a woman's baseball league okay which was a real thing yep because all the men are out fighting war league of their own yep exactly okay all right you might have sold me on that i will say i'm reading a digital dc comic right now called gotham city garage think post-apocalyptic like kind of mad max ish where all of humanity basically lives in this giant bubble and like lex luther is basically their god (laughs) And it follows um, Kara, Supergirl, who is smuggled out by her father, and I'm using finger quotes, so adoptive father, um, James uh, Gordon. I don't know why (laughs) I stumbled on that. Commissioner Gordon. um, Sneaks Kara out of this bubble, and when she gets out, she's able to sort of discover her powers and runs into this girl gang that's this biker gang that has, like, Big Barda and Harley Quinn and and uh, these sorts of characters. So it's the design is cool, and I'm actually kind of impressed by how much I like the story. It's very much like the first Injustice comics based on the video game, where it's, here's a future where Superman went insane because uh, the, the Joker... So you know how, like, in Kingdom Come, the Joker kills Lois Lane and blows up Metropolis? Yeah. And so... Um, and then uh, uh, Superman takes in the Joker but won't kill him. And then uh, Gog shows up, or Magog or whatever, yeah. kills the Joker, and everybody hails him as the hero we need. Yeah. So Superman goes into retirement. In this one, the Joker tricks Superman into killing Lois himself. He goes insane, murders the Joker, and then becomes a despot hmm. who takes over the world in order to keep everybody safe. That sounds neat. And so Batman and obviously everybody else, kind of the same way as with Kingdom Come, is they need to have the right to screw up even if people die. That's what freedom is about kind of thing. Yeah. Um, And those comics were really good. And funny, too. There was some very funny interactions, mostly between Harley Quinn and Green Arrow, where he's like, the Arrow Cave. He's like, really, the Arrow Cave? He's like, yeah. He's like, why don't you call it the Quiver? (laughs) <laughs> and, like, there's just this moment. And it's hilarious because Green Arrow had an arrow cave because everybody had a blank cave just like Batman. Yes. And he's like, why don't you just call it the quiver? And it was like, oh, my God. That's way better. <laughs> That's way better. <laughs> um, so I, I've, I've been en- enjoying that. But now I'm trying to think what all we got because you gave me, like, 20 bucks <laughs> and said, go find me comics. And I just picked up random trades. So I know one of them was Iron, Iron Man, Man 2020. 2020. Um uh mage yeah did you read that at all yet i haven't gotten okay. to that one yet i've um, heard i have started hit monkey okay tell me about hit monkey hit monkey is a very it's very deadpool-esque i'm just getting into it so i'm curious to see if it gets funnier because okay. that's one of the 
appealing things about Deadpool. It's it's very violent. It's a very uh, crass comic, but at the same time, it's funny. You know, the character breaks the fourth wall, Mm -hmm. talks to the reader, uh, is constantly making jokes about other Marvel Universe characters and Mm -hmm. their power sets and their uh, backgrounds. And um, this comic so far doesn't quite have the humor I was expecting from a comic called Hit Hit Monkey Monkey. about a Japanese macaque with super assassin powers. Yeah. Set in, is this the proper 616 Marvel Universe as well? Does this character oh, exist? I believe he does. That's and fantastic. In fact, I believe he's had run-ins with Deadpool. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Which, yeah, exactly. Okay. So is that something you would suggest to people to go and find, or you're not quite to the point yet of saying that? I wouldn't. I'm mean, not at the point where I'd recommend it, but if you do like those sort of ultra-violent Deadpool-esque comics, check that one out. Okay. I, I'm curious to see if it gets funnier, but uh, I'm assuming it does. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else for your weekly geekery? Oh, I uh, went to the opera, saw Don Pascal. Um, really? Typically, that uh, piece is set in Rome. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one kind of updates it, and uh, it's set in uh, on Sunset Boulevard in the 20s, the end of the silent film era, kind of. Okay. And the whole idea is that Don Pascal was this uh, claimed silent film star whose career kind of took a dive once, uh, you know, sound was introduced to films and once a uh, color was introduced and the cool one of the cool things they uh had film vignettes in between the acts showing his rise and fall and uh his uh conflict with his nephew ernesto is a uh, kind of a cool framing device it's all plotted out by the doctor his personal physician um anyway it was very neat uh i recommend you check out don pascal because even the original opera is great I didn't know you were an opera fan. <laughs> well, my grandfather has season tickets to the Ordway, and wow. he needed a buddy to come join him, and I'm yeah. always down for that. So, Wow. That is really interesting. I have never seen an opera. So now, I know that some people will dress up nice, some people really won't when they go to like just theaters for plays or musicals or whatever. Um, the opera traditionally, you know, is like black tie sort of. Were people all super fancied up for no, it? No. Okay. No. Um, it was not street clothes, but not tuxedos. Right. It was okay. just... Uh, think, just the same as anything else at the Ordway. Think church clothes. Okay. Yeah. Think collared shirts, uh, dresses maybe. Yeah. Um, in between Act 1 and 2, there was a uh, gathering, you know, where you could hobnob with each other, and there was champ- complimentary champagne and chocolates. Champagne? Champagne. Yes. Nice. Well, that's cool. That actually sounds like something I would almost enjoy. Now, is the my understanding most opera is sung in the it original? It was sung in Italian. Okay, but there were not subtitles. If anything, they were overtitles. A screen above the stage that would uh, display what they were saying in English. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, that's so really you cool. could keep up with the plot. You didn't need to know Italian. That sounds neat. Okay, I love that idea. Fantastic. Uh, anything else for the weekly geekery? Uh, nothing is springing to mind. That's what I'm watching. Mind Hunter. Well, finished watching now. Yeah. And I recommended it to the folks, and so I got them hooked. Um, reading all the graphic novels you got me, and I bought myself. I it was your it. money. Yeah, that's <laughs> it was right. My money. Um, but you got them for me. I always like that. Uh, nice surprise. You know, stuff I wouldn't normally buy for myself. Right. But surprise in getting these uh, hidden gems. Right. I try and do that to myself as well. Oh, and I loaned you Demon, uh, speaking of horror comics. Yes. um, Which is our topic. We'll probably get more into that later. Exactly. And we talked about that a little bit last week as well. But, um, yeah, good geek week. Well, let's let's get into some, I guess not news, but there's some reviews here where I want to go... Two trailers come out. Yep. First one, we'll call it the big one. Black Panther. Black Panther. I am seeing nothing but good stuff all over the internet. Obviously, uh, the poster is out, and they love the fact that there's only two white people on the poster. And I love the way they put it because there's two people on the white people on the poster, and it's uh, Bilbo and Gollum. <laughs> They're the Tolkien white guys. <laughs> That's right. And I loved that. Uh, and and just the reaction. People seem so empowered. And Mark Bernardin from Fat Man on Batman with the Kevin Smith podcast. Um, did a video where he was talking about how good trailers are about like a certain theme you know like he said he loved the man of steel trailer if not the movie because it's all about hope and this i love that trailer too you know um so in this case it was 
all about pride. Hmm. And I found that interesting, and, and maybe I need to revisit it. I thought it looked pretty good, but I have, I have, I do have an issue, one major issue about it. But I, I want to know what you thought first. What did you think of this trailer? I loved it. I okay. thought it was a great trailer. It's pretty much everything I'm looking for in a great trailer. It kept me interested, had me more interested for the movie. I'm already a fan of the Black Panther character. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, well, we'll see what a big screen adaptation of him is like. And this gets a lot of things right. And it was action packed. And really the dialogue, the little snippets we got was were pretty great. Yeah. And it had both a modern feel as well as a feeling of culture and tradition and stuff in there, which is what Wakanda is all about. Yeah. That in highly futuristic, but it doesn't lose its African roots. So I like that you see like the hovercrafts moving in and then you get a shot and it's like a crowded bazaar street, you yeah. know? Um, all right, let me get into this thing then. Here's my issue. It's another Marvel origin movie where he fights a stronger version of himself. That's the, what it looks like. The fact that they showed the two different Black Panther costumes and then the other guy puts on his own Black Panther costume. And I know that some people are like, oh, dude, that's, you know, really cool because like one glows purple because toys, kids. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the idea of having two of them fight. And I was like, but no, like, it's not that we need another movie about xenophobia, but the whole point of the culture is that they're there and they're hidden make the villain somebody from the outside and they don't need to be in a Black Panther outfit of their own. I think they're going to do that yeah. with uh, Ulysses Claw. Yes, which we get to see the Sonic Disruptor thing as his that hand splits open and he's like, yes, thank you. I'm totally down for that. I like Andy Serkis when he's not just doing mocap. Like in, uh, what was it, The Prestige, he was really good. Anytime that Andy Serkis is just playing a regular character, um, I think he does a great job. And so I, I want to see more of him because I think they did just a little bit with him in Age of Ultron. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm excited to see the movie. Don't get me wrong. I just, I hope it does more than what it looks like because yeah. it looks like it's going to be great, good visuals, uh, lots of style, lots of flavor. Um, it almost looks cyberpunky, Wakanda. Ex yeah, exactly. And that's what I mean. And this sort of has this interesting flavor was the term I, I use, you know, to it where it's this wonderful mix of different things, but I'm just, I'm so worried it's going to boil down to the same thing as Ant-Man and Iron Man yeah. and just uh, the Hulk, you where, know, you're going to fight. They're a... fighting another version of themselves yeah. that they have to punch to death. And yeah. in fact, that's pretty much every Marvel movie, especially when you go into the first one, you're right. either fighting uh, somebody, an opponent you have to punch, out punch or outsmart. Yeah. Sometimes you get that. And what I think Marvel's trying to do is what they did with the Avengers, where you combine them, where you have to outpunch the Chitari at the same time you have to outsmart Loki. Okay. And uh, Doctor Strange kind of did that. He had to outpunch the evil Khaleesi, yeah. or whatever his name <laughs> yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Concilius. Yeah. Concilius. Concilius, yeah. Concilius, he had to outpunch. And Dramu, he had to outsmart. That's interesting. So okay. I think they're go that's going to be the new template for the Marvel movies. You have brightened my <laughs> expectations then. Um, I hope that they do something similar to that. Because, I mean, yes, Black Panther, I mean, is certainly capable physically. Like, that's a big part of it. But the idea of him being the king, he's the character that, like, realistically Aquaman should be. Or Namor is seen. You know, the idea that yeah. there has to be that sense of... Um, is it regalness? Yeah. Re regality? Regality. I don't know what the term is. But that that uh, sense of authority about him. And that's what I want to see. Because he reluctantly takes up, because his dad dies yeah. in uh, Civil War, where he takes on that role. Um, and, you know, you don't know if he's ready for it. So I hope there's a little bit of that, because it's always good to have a self-conscious main character. Yeah. Uh, who, who gets to grow over the course of the film. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I am. I just, like I said... Cautiously optimistic. Yeah. The other trailer was New Mutants. And this is very interesting because they don't really show you a lot of no. what's going on. They don't really tell you who or what the New Mutants are outside of mutants existing well, in the X-Men universe. The only, they only use the word mutant once in the trailer. Right. I was going to say, my main takeaway, this could have easily been a trailer for a horror movie. But it <laughs> is. It's supposed to be. It is a horror movie. 
which is brilliant. It's what Fox is supposed to do because their X-Men movies are just kind of, you know, the last couple weren't great. Like, I don't, you know, Days of Future Past and uh, Apocalypse, right? Yeah. I Which I enjoyed same. both of those, especially Days of Future Past. In fact, I would probably say First Class may rank as one of my favorite X-Men movies. First Class, yes. The, the following two, I don't think were as strong of outings as First Class yeah. was. Um, and then, of course, just all of it messing with continuity and not saying, no, we're just going to make a movie. Watch it. Love it. It had to be, oh, we have to figure out a way to wrap it back into the rest of them. <laughs> but what this looks like it's doing is something similar to Logan. Obviously, Logan was piggybacking on all the X-Men movies, but they made a modern Western. And now with New Mutants, they're going to make a horror film. Yeah. That's tied into the X-Men universe. Perfect. Because they're keep the main X-Men movies for your action adventure films and then keep those light and interesting and then use the others to explore different genres and if you make a good movie it'll make money <laughs> but here's the problem I, I i always i need to be more positive because <laughs> i always bring it down now here's the problem <laughs> but no it's that supposedly new mutants already slated for a trilogy oh no that's not, not know that. there shouldn't be a, that's not a, it shouldn't be a happy reaction ray <laughs> that's a terrible reaction that make, was a surprise reaction make, not a happy okay reaction. make one good movie if the movie does well start talking sequels and understand that it's okay to go in a different direction everything doesn't have to be a trilogy <laughs> you know and granted they can cancel the trilogy if it doesn't do well but it means that in the planning of the first film and execution they're going to try and set up yeah. a trilogy. It's and gonna that, be a lot of table setting yeah. instead of a good self-contained story. And that's what lets people down. Like, I don't know if they realize this. As you're getting to the end of the movie and you don't finish up your story, so you can leave it open-ended, and you're like, cool, I guess I'll wait three years <laughs> for the second half of this story. <laughs> you know, that's not what audiences want. So I hope it's good. I'm interested in the idea of a horror film, and it's a bunch of teenagers, so I think it works. I, you can't really tell what the plot is. It's yeah. kids escaping from a clinic or something of that nature. Yeah, some sort of hospital. But... Yeah, like maybe in Logan, you know, they had the clinic where they were trying oh. to clone and figure out how to make... So maybe it ties movies. in with Logan, too. <laughs> I would rather it not, but that idea. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as with The Gifted, where there's... Um, the whole idea of The Gifted is the X-Men have disappeared, the Brotherhood have disappeared, because these new really strict anti-mutant laws came out or mutant regulatory laws because they're like there are people with powers and all of us are getting in the way we need to do something to protect people and so there's an outburst a kid uh, uh develops his powers while being bullied at school and then these what do they call it sentinel services or something <laughs> so it's a government agency mm. the sentinels and they come to take the kid away and they're like just for a little while but it's the safety of the community comes first and what do they call it the it's not the new Patriot Act. It's the something, pa like the stronger Patriot Act or something like that, an updated Patriot Act, which gives them the ability to come and arrest or detain mutants in order to protect the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the parents take the kids and run, and that's sort of <laughs> the general plot of the movie. Uh, but one of the characters at the beginning gets captured and brought and is held, and it's uh, Lorna Dane, also known as Polaris, oh. which, spoilers, three, two... One, maybe Magneto's daughter. Oh. It goes back and forth in the comics as to whether or not she's actually uh, the daughter of Magneto. He's got a lot of kids now. <laughs> oh, well, if you were Magneto, I mean, yeah. be fair. The ladies dig purple. But that purple and red, really the purple think underwear. really using protection. I mean, he already wears the helmet to protect him from Xavier. Yeah, exactly. Just saying. It's a helmet. Think about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but th that idea of detaining mutants, I think, is is a strong one. Because for whatever reason, I feel like with our X-Men mutant related stuff, we're veering away from, say, like X2, where they were very clearly drawing parallels between like being a mutant and being a homosexual yes. or, you know, whatever. And this doesn't seem to be doing it. it seems to be more of like you're a weapon kind of thing. So I don't know. I don't know how they're um, going to use what is generally always a metaphor. Yes. It's, and that's how kind of a constant it. with every X-Men interpretation is it's a metaphor for anyone who's downtrodden, whether it be right. people of color, whether it be immigrants, whether it be LGBTQ people. Yep. There's always that aspect of it. Right. And, and I would think if anything, it would be going 
more towards immigration and the idea of just because of who you are, we think you're dangerous. Yeah. Except these people actually like have super abilities that they're not necessarily able to control that could kill people. So maybe they won't drive that aspect home so much um, because they are trying to make a horror movie, you know? Well, right. With the new mutants. Yeah. And with gifted, I would, you know, it seems like they might just be like missing that point, which is kind (laughs) of that main focus. Um, but what I would love to actually see in like the gifted, if not the new mutants, show me the other side of that story, because yes, while they serve as a metaphor and that's absolutely important in art to do that in order to, to pass messages along, um, I would love to actually see the logic rationale from the other side of yes, but we're not just, it's not just blatant racism. We're not targeting you because you look different. We're targeting you because you shoot lasers out of your eyes that you can't control unless you wear these specific glasses. And we don't know if we can trust you to do that. You know, yeah. society at large doesn't know if they can trust you to do that. Uh, you know, your power is you cough wrong and everybody around you gets a disease. You know, we don't know. Every mutant power is different. Should there not be an agency? And maybe it's just because now I'm an old man, <laughs> you know, Um and I slowly become more conservative or something as I get older. But no. I want to see that argument and I want to see it actually put logically. And they do a little bit of it in the earlier X-Men movies. Yeah. Where like Jean Grey and Professor X are talking to whoever the it was, Senator, the UN or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Where they're like, you know, we license people to drive a car. He's like, but not to live. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I find that interesting. Maybe that's also because I'm older and I like boring things like philosophical discussion on the topics well, instead of just blowing stuff we do up. license people to live too you are issued a social security number yes and... that's true but... well anyway <laughs> so out of those two then because fox is doing their best to try and come back and they did it with deadpool and they did it with logan yeah so does new mutants beat out black panther for a movie you would look forward to because they trailers dropped it about the same time yeah, they did. Um, I would say I'm more excited for Black Panther again. I guess it's just because I have stronger feelings about that character. Okay. Um, I also feel strongly about the X-Men and the New Mutants, but um, I'm more excited for Black Panther. I thought that had the stronger of the two trailers. Yeah. And I'm excited to see where that character and where the Marvel Universe is going. I would say I'm more excited for Black Panther, but I'm more interested in New Mutants. Okay. Because I kind of have an idea that I know exactly where Black Panther is going. Yeah. We're all going just because we want to see first Black Panther, but clues for yeah. Infinity War and what's coming mm-hmm. next, you know, and, and Ragnarok is coming soon. The new Thor movie is coming soon as well, which hopefully will have clues to what's coming <laughs> and that sort of thing. But we have no idea what to expect from New Mutants. Good point. Because if it's totally unconnected from everything else, or even if it is, it's different characters, it's a different story, it's that sort of thing. That's much more interesting to me. Yeah. The same way Logan kind of was more interesting is we don't know what we're walking into. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I hope that's good. And then Joe from Geekitude, uh, big shout out to, to Joe, who I might actually get to see this weekend, because I guess he's going to be in Minnesota, uh, is a huge New Mutants fan. Oh. And now I am not super familiar with just the new mutants in general. I remember when they were part of Secret Wars 2, mm-hmm. but did you ever read New Mutants comic books? No, I did not. Okay. It was always under my it was the same as Teen Titans, mm-hmm. like big in the 80s, but it was under my radar. Yeah. So I'll be in I'm and that's the other thing. I'm going to see it the same way most people see other comic book movies and you don't know all of the the characters. Yeah. And their like stories. if they show Cannonball, I know who Cannonball is. But if they're doing all these little nods to the New Mutants comics, I'm not going to pick up on those. Yeah, there's going to be Easter eggs that I won't recognize. Exactly. And that's kind of interesting. I like that as a comic book guy. I have no problem going into something and not knowing what it is I'm getting into. But I'm sure we'll still do a prep episode, so I'll have to read up on the history of the New Mutants. (laughs) But uh, we'll try and keep it simple, I guess. Oh, I'd also like to throw a plug out for the uh, latest Black Panther comics that were written by... Tanahisi Cotes, okay, a Pulitzer Prize winning guy who hadn't written for comics before, but it's a very good run. So I'd like to recommend that. How long is it? Um, right now I believe there are three volumes, trade paperbacks out. Still going? Yeah, still going. Oh, perfect, cool. Well, so then you could also potentially do it through like the Marvel Unlimited app, yeah, which has uh, comics that are longer than six months old. I got that for yeah. my nephew for his birthday, and apparently my brother's been doing most of the reading, but <laughs> um. 
I've heard it's pretty good. I still haven't tried it. I still haven't jumped in. Uh, with the Black Panther? With the Black Panther or with the Marvel Unlimited app. Okay. Because I guess I got it where I was able to get a uh, buy one month, get one month free. So it was like nine bucks and my nephew can read as many comics as he wants for two months straight. Yeah. So uh, that's super tempting. I'm going to have to try it at some point just to try it and do an episode on it or something. Um, but yeah, so those are the trailers that I wanted to talk. I don't think there was any other new comic book trailers. We talked about the Justice League trailer last week. And we were trying to come up with a good name for Aqua Bro or Broke <laughs> Broqua Man, you know, Broqua Dude, because Jason Momoa is just an utter bro dude in that. Uh, but I don't think it was any other trailer. So we're going to get into our topic of the week right after we come back from listening to some wonderful commercials for other shows on the network. So we will be right back. I'm Void. And I'm Beach. And together we're the Geek to Geek podcast. Well, we make it. It is kind of us, but I guess it's separate. Every week, we pick a topic from geek or digital culture and chat about it for a while. And you're invited. We talk about books and movies, games, comics, the internet. Or really whatever we feel like. Yeah, that too. So look for the geek to geek podcast on iTunes. Or wherever your podcasts are sold. Or downloaded. Or whatever. Hi, my name is Joe Hogan, and I'm a geek. And if you're currently listening to this there's a good chance you're a geek too. So check out my podcast, Geektitude. Each week, I talk with somebody about their geek aptitude. Sometimes I talk to people in a geeky profession. Sometimes it's someone doing something really cool with their geekiness. Often it's another geeky podcaster. But it's always someone who wants to share their inner geek. So join me each week as we come together to geek out about all the geeky stuff we love. And remember, this week, keep it geek. Hey everyone, I'm Katie. And I'm Chelsea, and we're the hosts of the podcast, Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea. We are two best friends who love pop culture. We try to have a female perspective on things, but we really just talk about anything we like. What are some recent topics we've done, Katie? Uh, Well, we've talked about girl power songs, Wonder Woman, Veronica Mars, young adult fiction novels, San Diego Comic Con, and so much more. So grab your cup of tea or whatever your drink of choice is and download our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher and start listening today. And we are back. Hooray. Uh, We are part of the geek to geek podcast network, folks. So like and subscribe. You can't like, but star ratings, reviews, uh, subscribe, because uh, we don't pay to advertise at all. We do our best with social media and we're really terrible at it. So word of mouth and you guys giving us those extra star ratings and reviews on iTunes is the only way that anybody new finds our shows. So please help. Have you ever listened to any of the other shows, Ray? Um, No, but I have given a cursory look to the other shows and mm-hmm. I'm very interested in getting in on some of them. Very cool. It wasn't. I wasn't trying to pressure you. I just didn't know if you had uh, listened to any of them. Um, but I haven't listened. I am on... What did I do? I think I just finished up Joe's most recent episode of Geektitude, and then I still have to listen to the newest episode of Tea Time with Katie and Chelsea, where they talk all about Beetlejuice. So I'm, lo- <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I really liked their last episode, which was about the Scream movies and the TV show. Oh. So, yeah, they're, they're kind of doing the same thing where it's all sort of Halloween-themed <laughs> stuff. So it's a lot of fun. All right. So our topic of the week with a dot, dot, ba do ba do do ba do ba 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 Like, you just lay down the, like, two beats. Two. <laughs> Perfect. Topic of the week. And our topic this week is horror comics for the third week in a row. Because the first week... Uh, I did my best to remember. I I only pulled a couple titles of horror comics to talk to Liam about. He canceled at the last minute, so I went (laughs) solo. It was a short episode. Last week, I had a long list of horror comics, and Liam and I talked. But uh, last year, my Halloween episode, I wanted to do something different. And I talked all about the history of EC Comics, of horror comics. And it was all stuff I didn't know, and it's stuff now that I don't remember. (laughs) So you're all welcome to go back and listen to that. But this week, we're going to talk to Ray about those actual comics and whether or not, I guess, the reputation they gained was well-deserved or not. Because we've talked about the history of the Comics Code Authority before and how they used some of these horror comics, one in particular, which was an image of a hand holding a woman's head that had been severed and was no longer connected to her body. And that was held up as children shouldn't see this. We need to get rid of these types of books and decimated the comic book industry 
when they introduced the Comics Code Authority or forced comics to introduce it to police themselves. Yeah. Uh, but now, how old were you when you started reading the horror comics? Because you said you discovered your your dad and your uncle's comics at a young age. Did they let you dive straight into the horror stuff? Um, I wasn't supervised very well. I think I started. <laughs> I think I started reading them when I was like six or seven. Okay. I know that the Tales from the Crypt TV show started airing a couple years after. Right. Yeah. And I was like, "Hey, the Crypt Keeper. I know him from comics." Yep. Yeah, so uh, that was a HBO series, I believe. That was sort of a horror anthology, just like the comics were. Was kind it? Of. Was it HBO? I believe it was HBO. Maybe wow. in the early. days. I feel like I used to see it on network television Fox, late at night. I believe okay. it was also okay. Yeah, it's at some point in the nineties, but again, it was the yeah, late night program. It was late night. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have been watching that either. But so and and now these comics had the weird titles like eerie. Yeah. And weird stories, or yeah, what, what were some of the tales. names of the ones that you had? Um, like, I believe Strange Tales, uh, Tales of Horror. They all have tales in them. Duck Tales. Duck no. Tales. Uh, Terrifying. But, um, yeah, I just remember a lot of the covers um, uh, were very spooky in, uh, in and of themselves. A lot of the art. Um, the stories were just sort of, a lot of them were just generic horror stories, you know, like... Uh, a doctor loses his hand and does surgery to replace it and it turns out he replaced it with a killer's hand (laughs) and of course now he has an evil hand that wants to murder people okay um so i feel like that was because i I feel like the twilight zone did a lot of that too but maybe i'm thinking of um uh tales from the crypt because i feel like i I would watch it every once in a while and the idea is every single episode is Somebody gets something that belonged to a killer that yeah. turns them into a killer. Like the Simpsons did the hair. Yeah. Snake's hair. I remember, I think it was a Twilight Zone episode where it was a pair of shoes. Okay. That belonged to a killer or yeah, something. It's got to be just a haunted possession of some sort. Yeah, exactly. That that carries the spirit. Okay. But so what, I mean, if you had to, um, I guess, characterize or sort of define these comics, like what makes a comic book one of these EC horror comics? Like, what are the things that all of them had in common? A lot of comics that I enjoy, you you could designate as horror comics. My favorite comic of all time is The Sandman by Neil Gaiman. And major character in that comic book series is the Corinthian, who is a serial killer with supernatural powers. okay. But I wouldn't call that a horror comic because its intent isn't always to frighten you. A good horror comic, its intent is to frighten you. Um, that's what I would give you nightmares, you know, make you stay awake at night. That's what it's going for. Okay. Like, uh, walking dead. I would actually classify that as a horror comic. Um, it's intent is to frighten you and eventually, you know, like every piece of zombie fiction, um, they come to realize that they don't have to be so worried about the zombies. It's the other survivors who have become more evil. Right. So it's human nature, yes, which is it's a terrifying the real thing. monster. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would classify that as another modern horror comic that's very popular. Um, yeah. But that's how I would classify it. Distinguishing between, you know, a comic with horrific elements yeah. and a distinct horror comic. Okay. So what was it at that age that drew you to those comics? What kept you reading them? Um, I liked scary stories as a kid. I okay. liked that. And just the concepts and, you know, really attracted me. I was also a big Twilight Zone fan as a kid. Again, just those weird sci-fi uh, concepts and horror concepts mm-hmm. really attracted me. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the art in those books. Because I feel like if you go back and you see one of those EC horror comics, it almost, the covers especially, seem to have a very distinctive style. Yeah. A, um, if I was going to put an artist to it, because I'm not great with artists, I would say Bernie Wrightson, if I got that name right, co-creator of The Swamp Thing. Yeah, very much so. But it's the early stuff. If you go and you look at, and it looked like, you know, heavy inks, um, very strong lines, and like, Almost muted colors, yes. I feel like. Um, I have to throw this out there. The best horror comics currently being published mm-hmm. are coming out of Japan. Okay. So, And that's very much the manga style. Heavy lines, um, black and white typically. 
um, yeah, I would say those are where most of and probably some of the best of horror comics are coming from. Interesting. Okay. And I suppose to your point, that is very true. I generally, I like comics with horror elements in them. I have a lot of them, mm-hmm. but I don't know that I have any comics that disturb me to the point where I'm actually scared. Yeah. And, but part of that is, I think, you know, if you're going to scare me, you might have to jump out at me to do it. <laughs> I enjoy the creepy factor. But even with The Walking Dead, The Walking Dead to me is a soap opera that takes place in a world filled with zombies. Yeah. There are horror elements of it. I I think broadly it's a horror comic because it deals with the horrors of humanity and what people will do to one another if they think there's no other option in order to survive or just through selfishness. Um, And then obviously there's all the gore and the zombies and things Mm -hmm. falling apart. But I'm trying to think if there was ever a comic book that I read as a kid that like really messed with my head and Mm -hmm. i don't know if i can think of one but i never read i there was no way those comics were going to be allowed Mm -hmm. my earliest comics were some green lantern comics my mom had some old like captain america and thor books and then it was whatever they had at the library which was like random issues of like star trek comics (laughs) that were ripped in half lots of archie (laughs) yeah i never read archie I, i managed to not um but it was just lots of random superhero stuff from the 90s and so that's what I grew up on. I never really got to horror comics until, boy, I don't even know if it was The Walking Dead. I'm trying to remember when I read the first Batman Dracula story, because that's very much kind of a horror tale. I'll throw this out there, too. There are a lot of Batman comics I would call horror comics. Yeah. Like The Long Halloween, and especially Arkham Asylum, yes. the serious house on serious earth. I would call that a horror comic. Yes. It is a Batman comic. He does go around punching bad guys and they're fighting back. But at its core, it's a horror comic. You know what? I'll give you this. Oh, boy. I can't remember where it is now. Um, It was a story and I feel like a larger compilation. And it is the one story that always stuck with me. And it was kind of a Batman story, but not really. Oh, boy. I got to find this. All right. Well, I'll just say when I do, I'll tell you about it. But when I find it, if I find it, I will make sure to post it on, we'll say Twitter, on, on our Twitter account. The story is about a guy who goes into... Oh, you know what? Maybe it was um, the DC, like, Batman villains, 80-page giant or something like that. Uh, Like a Secret Files and Origins kind of thing. I think that's what it was. I think it was the DC villains or or Gotham City villains or something. I want to go and look now, but I don't want (laughs) to stop the podcast. But I kind of want to. Are you cool if I do? <laughs> yeah, that's okay, fine. Right. We can edit this out. I'll be right back. So now it's Dr. Ray's podcast. Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> you talk for a couple minutes. I'm going to go find this thing. Um, yeah, so uh, I grew up reading a lot of horror comics. Um, I very much enjoyed them as a kid. The spooky story uh, aspect of it. Kind of like sitting around a campfire trying to scare the pants off of one another as kids. Um. But as I grow older, I'm not reading as many horror comics anymore. Again, I would say the scariest stuff that I have read recently in the most recent years is manga. So if you're interested, check out some scary manga. I like that you actually filled the time. All right. (laughs) You can edit that out. No, no, I'll leave it in. I was really surprised I got this. All right. So this is October 1998, Batman Villains, Secret Files and Origins. And it is the very first story in it called Scream If You Love Me. And it's written by Alan Grant, actually, (laughs) uh, with penciler Frank Terran. I, this one stuck with me. And I'm pretty sure I bought this off the shelf. So I would have been 13 (laughs) at the time. And uh, it's about a guy who gets sent to Arkham Asylum for, like, killing his family or something, but keeps claiming he's innocent. And then he gets picked by the Joker as, you're going to be my stoolie, you're going to help me with my plans. And so he just keeps ending up getting into fights and, um, uh, again, keeps protesting and saying he's innocent um, and is slowly losing his sanity. Because then, eventually, in the end, I'm just going to spoil it for everybody (laughs) because I don't expect people to hunt this thing down. uh, He ends up getting electroshock therapy, which is one of the few things in the world that absolutely messes with me (laughs) the idea of somebody doing that to you and you losing part of who you are that personality kind of thing um i find scary and so in the end he they find out that he's innocent and they rush to go uh release him and then the alarms go off and you find out that he's in the kitchen with a shiv 
and his head is all shaven now, and he's, like, half insane, and he's murdered, like, five people in Arkham. So the idea is the place itself makes you insane, even if you're sane going in. And that story has always stuck with me. I'm going to leave that out because I'm going to actually read that again later. (laughs) That's good. That's good Halloween reading. But it was one of those stories that I loved. Like, I wanted... We would never see that as an episode of the animated series. (laughs) But that kind of story. Yeah. That is a horror story told in the Batman universe, and Batman's not in it at all. (laughs) The Joker is in it. Killer Croc is in it. Uh, I'm trying to think if uh, maybe Mr. Zaz might be in it. Or Victor Zaz. Um, Yeah, they just call him Mr. Zaz, don't they? (laughs) Well, know. a lot Zazz. of Batman, and especially his rogues gallery, are yeah. horror stories, basically. Yes. Whether it's Clayface or Killer Croc, you know, Zaz is a great example of someone who's basically, you know, it's Hannibal Lecter light. <laughs> right. I mean, he's, of all of, of Batman's villains, he is kind of the most generic of serial killers. Yeah. They just gave him the twist of he puts a scar on his body. He makes a tally mark for every person he's killed. Everybody else has superpowers, falls into a vat of something or yeah. other. Um, but it's it's those sorts of elements that I think where I was like, this is a horror comic. And there are certainly other ones that have that, you know, but that are maybe just more uh, dark fantasy even where there's yeah. mystical elements. Have you elements. read the Brian Boland Batman story? He was the artist on The Killing Joke. The one where it's the good man who wants to do something really bad just to see if he is actually a good person. That sounds familiar. Like, uh, he's a Gotham citizen who, like, goes to church and volunteers and is very neighborly. But he wants to do something really bad just to see if he is actually a good person. Okay. And his idea is, like, you know, kidnapping a child and starving them to death. But no, that's not good enough. He wants to kill Batman. Then I know maybe I haven't read that. That's interesting. He just wants to, you know, sniper style, take Batman out because here's a force for good unquestionably. And he just, right. if I can kill Batman, that will see be my ultimate uh, test of that's interesting. moral integrity. I like that. And see, and that's the thing that Batman sort of allows. I, I wonder if he's almost embodying some of what the EC comics used to do. And take some of those really horrifying stories and elements and figuring out a way to incorporate them into a major company like the DC Universe. Because I don't know that Marvel really... I guess they have, like, Morbius, the living vampire, and Blade, and Man-Thing. Yeah. Right? Who, like... And Ghost Rider, obviously, might be their main version of that, where there's horror stories. And the early Moon Knight stuff. Yeah. Actually. It was a lot of, of very horror-like things. Oh. So, what do you think of... Those horror comics that you read. And do you know sort of what the dates were on those? Like what years those they comics were? They were reprints. Okay. Um, after the comics, uh, Comic Code Authority, you know, was the kibosh was put on that. Yeah. They reprinted a lot, a lot of those Tales from the Crypt uh, issues mm-hmm. in the mid-60s. So that's the issues my father and his brothers bought and yeah. the ones I eventually read in the early 90s mid 90s so how do you think reading those stories in particular i feel like this explains a lot and i'm trying to find a way to ask a question that instead of me just saying it how do you think having those among some of the first comic books you read shaped you as a comic book reader versus somebody who say grew up reading superman comics yeah um i think it definitely sent me on the path that i could deal with the darker more uh serialized um not necessarily uh long form storytelling but just this issue is going to tell this story beginning to end and so that's probably why i still buy loose issues because i just want to read a good story beginning to end and not necessarily have to go back week after week to get it and why i'll buy if that's what i'm gonna or if that's the route the story is gonna take i'll just wait for the trade so I think it did influence me in certain ways. Uh, another EC comic that I read as a kid mm-hmm. didn't get all the political references, and it was pretty adult for me. Mad Magazine. Okay. So again, that informed my sense of humor, I think, a lot. Yeah, I remember enjoying Spy vs. Spy. Yeah. And that was pretty much it, because everything else, it the, the Mad was always too jam-packed, where they always had a big spread, and the art was too convoluted or uh, not even convoluted but the way that it was colorized and stuff it just looked like somebody threw up on the page uh with the art style and 
Uh, it never clicked with me growing up. We thought Mad Magazine was cool, <laughs> but it was like, oh, it's just they drew, you know, Val Kilmer really poorly. <laughs> And they're having him say things, but I don't care what he's saying. <laughs> but that's really interesting. And, and I, you know, to explain why I was asking that question is I think about the comics that you like to read that you always suggest to me. It's never something simple. <laughs> it's always something that engages you on a different level versus a simple Batman punching a guy in the face because he's trying to rob somebody. You know, it's Transmetropolitan. It's Sandman. Um I guess to a lesser extent demon, but, (laughs) but the idea that you tend to push these comics and suggest these comics that maybe I wouldn't otherwise read because you have, and I mean, part of it's probably just you and personal. You're a super smart guy. (laughs) Um, Mr. Opera. I go to the (laughs) opera, Uh, but that idea, you know, is, is you're open to the monocle just fell off. Yeah. In, in, uh, in, uh, humility. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I think that's, really interesting like i because i could see like you know i i don't have any kids but i got multiple nieces and nephews and i'm trying to imagine my brother giving like his kids uh his oldest is uh just turned 13 i i wonder how old he would have to be before my brother would be okay with like here have this thing where somebody like cuts people apart and eats them like on the cover of the comic (laughs) you know uh, versus being able to go and do that at a young age. I mean, for me, I, I, the first time I saw horror movies, I was really young. I think we talked about that in an episode where my uh, it was my uncle uh, Bob showed us the original Blob, you know, okay. or whatever. But we watched, I think, The Thing, and I know for sure we watched at least the first Alien. And I must have been like eight, you know. And ever since then, I was obsessed with monsters. I just, I love that idea of uh, using that to explore different things. And as a kid, I just liked them because they looked cool. Yeah. They were more interesting than regular people. <laughs> uh, but I, am I right in saying that those comics dealt less with, like, supernatural creatures and more of, like, people? Were they? Yeah. They would often, I would say, like, the Twilight Zone often dealt with these psychological, uh, not impairments, but quirks of people. Mm-hmm. Like, being someone who likes to read and then having that, taken away from you when to have the chance to read all you want right you know mm-hmm. the classic it was twist. time now time the guy at last. Loses his glasses time at last um no that would was the thing that was appealing to me and that would often be dealt with in the horror comics mm-hmm. too it was just you know this person is obsessed with a maybe a hypochondriac who thinks his skeleton is trying to leap out of his body and then at the end it does so he interesting was right down, that kind of idea I love that. Of, uh, you know, my skeleton is still growing, but the rest of me isn't, you know. Interesting. Um, but I, I, a hypochondriac I, who finds a quote unquote doctor who yeah. tells him that. I find it interesting that, you know, once you're able to shift it away to a swamp thing or whatever, or Batman's villains, they all have kooky costumes and superpowers, or well, I guess a lot of Batman's villains don't necessarily have powers, but they're given that comic book shine i guess even the terrible ones the scarecrow has a costume the joker has a costume mr freeze has a costume clayface you know so underneath they're the same characters as those ec horror comics the people where they take one thing and they spin it yeah you know um but then they take it further in order to make it, I guess, more appealing. Because if it was just a person, like picture Batman comics, getting rid of the rogues gallery or making everybody dress like a normal person. Mm -hmm. Two-Face isn't actually disfigured. He just sees himself that way in the mirror. Yeah, he's just got multiple personalities. Because that sounds like a, a Twilight Zone episode. And in fact, that was how they did it on the animated series. If you remember, there was an episode where like he actually got healed. They actually fixed his face but he still saw himself as that yeah and i'm trying to remember if eventually he burns himself like he i mean two-face gets fixed all the time in the (laughs) comics and then he either scars himself again or burns himself again because he can't stand to not um but just that idea of all those different characters yeah and and i find that very interesting um well cool is there any kind of last things that you would want to say about ec comics or um anything in particular you would suggest to people who might want to go out, because you can still find them now. Oh, yeah. In both um, uh, trades and digitally, I think, even, maybe. 
yeah, your audience may want to check them out. There are trades of EC Comics. Tales from the Crypt would probably be my uh, favorite one. Just because um, of the nostalgia with the TV show? Yeah. Or were just, they better stories? Um, I think it's mostly nostalgia. Okay. And the Crypt Keeper is such an engaging figure, the storyteller. Um, yeah, he's a good framing device, the Crypt Keeper. Probably one of my top five. Okay, yeah. well, we'll call that our poll list for next week, then. Um, how about this? My okay. favorite horror comic of all time, a little bit not as goofy. Yeah. Uh, From Hell by Alan Moore. I tried reading that once. It is so thick, though. Yeah. And it's he, a lot of reading, because it's Alan it is Moore. It a thick one, yeah. And he writes pages of stuff. A lot of dialogue. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to be an easy read just because it's a graphic novel. It's, okay. Well, what, we'll... 550 pages, and yeah. All right, well, let's say this. Three things for the poll list. You guys get to choose what you want to go out and find. I will say Batman Villains Secret Files and Origins number one from October 1998. We will say From Hell, if you have time, because <laughs> it's a long one, or to go and pick up some Tales from the Crypt. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll go and see if I can find a cheap trade at one of the local comic book stores, something I can pick up for five bucks or something. Um, because I wouldn't, I don't think I would have a problem having that on my on my shelf. Yeah. Well, very cool. I like that. That was a good conversation. Uh, well, uh, why don't you take us into the end of the show, Ray? Yeah, get down. Get... <laughs> All right. That is, that is, you know, while I say wobble wobble, because it's me, that makes me think of um, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back where they go to visit Brody in the comic shop. And he says, and with that, we cue the music. And he goes, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> And the reason I'm going to bring that up, randomly, we're here in Egan, Minnesota right now recording. I'm originally from Bloomington. Uh, but Eden Prairie, Minnesota, is where the Eden Prairie Mall is, which is where they filmed Mall Rats. And Kevin Smith was there yesterday. So that would be, I don't know the date off the top of my head, but a Tuesday. 17th? Yeah, the 17th, we'll say. Uh, and he was doing some live Facebook stuff. He was walking around the mall and I was like, I'm at home. I was working from home yesterday and it was like, I saw it and it said one hour ago and it was like, oh man, if I had been not working and paying attention to Facebook and I had seen that he started, cause I don't, I don't think I follow him on Facebook, but I have friends who do and share stuff every once in a while and share that he was at Eden Prairie mall. I wonder if I would have jumped in my car, <laughs> driven the half hour over there to see if I could catch him still walking around just to get a picture and give the guy yeah. a hug and say, thank you for making it okay for nerds like us who swear far too often mm -hmm. are jerks to all of our friends, like to just sit around and come up with funny stories to take those stories and do something with them or go create some sort of content. Because he kind of championed that, I think, for me anyway. I was very much a little Kevin Smith guy. <laughs> um, but uh, I thought that was very cool. Okay, anyway, end of the show. Ray, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I will add your contact information. We can find you on Facebook. Is there anything else that you are doing that you would like to plug? Um, not currently. Okay, because I know... Well, are you still uh, speaking with the... Brain, Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance. Feel free to uh, donate to that wonderful organization. You can find them at mnbraininjuryalliance.org. Wonderful. Because I know we went and did the walk, and you were saying that you would, were doing um, the, like speeches or whatever yeah, for them. Yeah, volunteering them talks. there as part of their Speakers Bureau. They've been very helpful to me after my traumatic brain injury. Very cool. Um, as far as us here at the show, you can find us everywhere. Um, we are part of the geek to geek Podcast Network, so you can find us on Facebook and Reddit and YouTube if you search geek to geek Cast. You can find us personally, this show, on Twitter at ComicBoxCast. I am on there personally at Nobi. You can find us on Slack, which I believe is slack.com slash geek to geek cast Feel free to hit me up on Twitter or any one of us hosts on there, and we can uh, send you a link and you can join us. I had never used Slack before. Think of it like a giant group chat with multiple different channels. There's a channel for every show. There's a general chat, one that's just about weekly geekery because that's uh, the listeners to, we'll say the network, I can't speak for this show in particular, but certainly the geek to geek podcast, um, like to go online and share their own weekly geekery. And it's sort of the way that our whole community gets together. And, and uh, it's an easy way to get into a conversation with a fellow geek, because everybody is expected to sort of just volunteer, well, not expected, but encouraged to just share what they've been geeking out about that week. And she can say, oh, I don't know about that. Tell me more. Or people saying, yeah, I have been playing 
Destiny 2, or I know Void has been playing, um, what is it, Shadow of War, the new Lord of the Rings game. Which looks good, but I, I'm waiting. I still have to play through another Batman game. <laughs> I got video games. I don't do video games a whole lot. Um, but that is it. That is it for this week. Uh, make sure you guys, again, subscribe. Star ratings and reviews are always awesome. We thank you guys for doing that. Next week is going to be Halloween week. So I am going, or rather, it'll come out the weekend before Halloween. Close enough. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. Ray, like Liam, we worked on a TV show together in college, the three of us. And we used to do something different on Halloween where we broke format. Yeah. Uh, we would do it for Christmas, too, <laughs> where we'd break the regular comedy news thing and do this weird side thing. I keep thinking how much fun it would be. Do you remember when we did the Shadower, the, the radio, <laughs> the radio show? opera. I kind of want to see if I can find it. I might just make that next week's episode. <laughs> it it features uh, Dr. Ray as the narrator. <laughs> Fletch is the main character. The Shadower. <laughs> It's exactly like The Shadow, but without us getting sued, I think was the tagline. <laughs> um, I don't know if Liam is in it, but then several other people. Cody, Cody's never been on the show. He was in it. Ben also has never been on the show. Uh, he was in it. Other people from our TV show in college. Yes. Uh, a bunch of our college buddies are in it. So if I can track it down, that might be next week's episode. I'll still intro it and outro and throw in the commercials and all that. Uh, so if you don't hear us talking, I hope everybody has a really good Halloween. Thank you guys for joining us. Ray, thank you once more. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. We are closing the comic box. This is issue, I didn't look, 70, I think. I believe this is issue 70 of the comic box. Closing it. We will see you guys next week. ba da bow ba 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 da da do bow dow Alright. Oh, you didn't want to do a thing? Cheers! There it is. <laughs>